When you think about science and technology museums, like the one we're in here today, perhaps, lesbian, gay, bi, trans and queer stories might not be at top of mind, but perhaps they should be. Because it turns out that science museum collections that we think of as objective and neutral are more shaped by culture than we think. Our next speaker has not only conducted research on this topic, she has also worked as a tour guide of queer stories and identities at the Science Museum in London. Currently a postdoctoral researcher at Stockholm University, her research focuses on how culture shapes and is shaped by science. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Eleanor S. Armstrong. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for letting me present in English. My Swedish is uh, like a baby, so I think that everyone is probably better off not hearing me have to do that. Um, and certainly, you'll learn more this way, even if your English is um, a little rusty. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Ellie Armstrong. Um, I currently work at Stockholm University, um, where I'm interested in questions about um, the, the way that we learn about science and, and what we learn when we're thinking about that. And for a long time, I've been interested in museums particularly. Um, I also used to work at the Science Museum in London, which is going to be the subject of the talk, but I'll talk a little bit about some other stuff um, in, that I've done as well. Um, but I want to start this presentation before we dive deep into the project that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, thinking uh, about what it means to talk about museums, um, to talk about queering museums, to talk about doing activism, uh, all kind of um, what we might think of as like political, even though I'm going to just challenge the idea that any work is non-political, because I think all work is political, it just sometimes aligns with like the normative politics, and so we don't see it as being political. Um, and you'll notice I'm wearing a shirt that says museums are not neutral. Um, I know um, my, my baby Swedish has encouraged me to believe that there was a conversation earlier about how people really trust the narratives that museums make. Um, and I think when we think about how we are shaping those narratives and the types of stories we tell, we've got to be really critical about what it is that we are encouraging members of the public to trust in. What stories are we telling them? How do they look to museums as spaces of uh, knowledge um, and, and obje of objective and kind of authentic? I know this word has come up a couple of times through other presentations, knowledge. Um, and when I talk about queering, I see this really as part of a larger project of anti-colonial work within museums that might challenge and change the kinds of colonial and enlightenment structures that museums are founded in. Uh, we've already had a talk today about kind of restitution and returning objects, but um, in addition to this kind of thing, we can think of, in addition to this kind of decolonial work um, that focuses on uh, work in the past and kind of making amends for having these objects in the collection. Uh, we can think about taking positions on current colonial projects and co current colonial actions and genocides around the world as museums. Um, we can think about uh, tackling questions about sexism and gender-based violence. We can think about uh, racism, disability, and as I'm going to talk about in this talk, uh, queer and queer heritage um, in these contexts. And I don't think we can really think about any of these one things as separate from this larger project that challenges the idea that museums are telling a neutral and impartial story. All stories are partial. Um, and bringing uh, these ideas to the fore to your museum audience um, is a way of making it clear to them um, that museums are taking a perspective um, on the stories that they are telling. So, uh, because I know that not everyone uh, speaks English as a first language in here, in fact, maybe I'm the only person who speaks English as a first language, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I'm using the word queer. Queer in English, in particular in the UK, has a history as a word that was uh, used as a slur against gay men in particular, um, and it has been reclaimed by that community and is used to describe what we might think of as an umbrella community of people who identify as lesbian, gay, trans, bisexual, uh, ace, aspectral, um, stuff like this. Um, and it's kind of used as this umbrella identity term, so we can think about queer in that way as like an identity, so I might identify myself as queer. Um, but we also can use queer in the context of theory, in the same way we might use words like feminism, um, where we think about doing queer work uh, as 
a, a kind of analytical lens that we can use to look at knowledge in the world. And I'm using, in this tour, we use the word queer in both of these ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some queer heritage, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we can use queer perspectives to unpack what is being talked about in science museums. Um, so because I'm not confident that everyone's been to the Science Museum, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a sense of what the Science Museum in London is like. Um, it's a huge museum. It's part of a larger group, the Science Museum group, where there are uh, other museums around the UK. But the Science Museum itself is situated in South Kensington in London, which is the site of the Great Exhibition, where Prince Albert in the Victorian period got people from all over the British Empire and other parts of the world, uh, the then British Empire, to bring uh, their things and show how wonderful the British Empire was to British people uh, in an incredibly colonial way. It raised a lot of money. It was extremely popular. And the money that was raised from that incredibly colonial practice um, founded and funded did the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, and the Victorian Albert Museum in what is known loosely as Albertopolis. It's also where Imperial College, um, Imperial College the Science um, and Technology University of the UK is, uh, as well as things like the Royal Albert Hall and Hyde Park. Um, but the Science Museum gets over three million visits a year. This was data from 2018. I think it's probably about the same now, given pandemic and then coming back. Um, and these three million visitors constitute about 6% of all visits in the entirety of the UK to galleries, libraries, archives, and museums that are funded by the UK Department of Culture, Museum, Culture Media, and Sport, which is the, like, um, the organization that funds these institutions. As somebody already mentioned today, most museums in the UK that are publicly funded by DCMS are free, so you don't have to pay to go in. Um, but the reason we get so many visits at the Science Museum in London, this 6% of all, all are like truly mind-blowing, like 1 in 20 visits to a, to a gallery, library, museum, or archive in the entirety of the UK happens in this one museum, um, is because they have a lot of stuff for kids. Um, and so also when we're thinking about what stories museums are telling, we can be really particularly critical about who is receiving that knowledge when they come to that space. Um, and I think when we think about the, no the stories that we tell the youth, um, who are particularly looking for knowledge that they can deem as like, um, you know, objective and, and true, um, it's, it's even more critical to think carefully about what we're telling there. Um, so I'm going to tell you one of the objects that we had on a tour that I ran. We ran this tour every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, for the month of July in 2018. Um, one of the objects was this. This is a Spitfire plane. Um, these were flown by people in the RAF. Oh, my God, I would never be able to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> These were flown by the Royal Air Force in the UK during the Second World War. Uh, they were generally bomber planes. Um, but what we thought about in this was not just the aeroplane itself, but a pilot who flew an, a Spitfire aeroplane during the Second World War. This is Roberta Cowell. She was one of the RAF bombers. She was actually shot down in her flight um, over Germany, interred in a prisoner of war camp, uh, where the conditions were so terrible that they ended up eating cats that were running around to stay alive. We know a lot about Roberta Cowell and her life, her early um, degree at the University College London in chemical engineering, where she met her wife through a book that she wrote in the 1970s or 1980s, um, which tells us a lot about the kinds of privileges that Roberta Cowell had, like to be able to write a book and have it published about yourself speaks to both uh, literacy and also affluence and being connected um, into a world where people would be able to read and publish your book. Um, and it wasn't just that Roberta Cowell was tied in with people who'd be able to help her publish her book. She also knew this man, Michael Dillon. Michael Dillon is the first man in the UK to re receive a phalloplasty surgery, which is a like penis uh, gender, aff gender affirming surgery. Um, and he connected Roberta Cowell with Harley Street doctors in the 1950s, where she received the world's first vaginoplasty. Um, Roberta Cowell um, 
was then featured in newspapers at the time, unlike the UK's massive wave of transphobia at the moment. Um, the acceptance of trans people in the 1950s and 1960s was reasonably high. Um, and it featured in this way, not in a scandalized discussion or a, like kind of a baiting piece of media, um, a discussion about uh, Roberta Cowell's history as part of the RAF, the, the British military, and now um, leading her latter part of her life as a woman. But what we also highlighted at this stop in the tour is that there are many people in the history of science and technology like Roberta Cowell who do not have the agency to write about themselves. Um, we see here pictures of uh, doctors uh, James Barry and Alan Hart, neither of whom are well known or well understood, largely because there are very few sources that write about their experiences as trans men in the 1800s and 1930s respectively. And what this tells us is that the kinds of stories that we can tell about LGBTQ history and queer heritage is so strongly shaped by who has access to being able to write down and narrate their own lives. And this is the kind of narratives that um, we can pull up and we can point to. And um, actually, there's a really interesting book by a scholar called Kit Hayam that's called Before We Were Trans, which I'd recommend to all of you, which talks about how we might navigate language around, for example, identity in the past, but also really tackles this question uh, of what are we able to talk about in the first instance based on who knew, uh, who was able to talk about themselves. Um, and so in this kind of brief run through of one of the stops that I have massively condensed and also I'm showing you out of the context of the gallery. Um, I've shown you how we can talk about individuals in queer history and as well as being able to demonstrate these kind of queer critical approaches to histories that we tell in museums. So these are some of the people who came on the tours around the Science Museum with us in the summer of July 2018. You'll notice many of these are in this gallery that's kind of purple and uplit and quite white. Uh, this was, at the time, the only gallery in the museum with air conditioning, and it was like the most blisteringly hot summer. So this was like where we managed to get people to stay for a little bit longer so that we could take a picture. Um, but we reached over 120 people for a project that was basically just me and my colleague Damien writing about this, telling about people about the, writing about this on social media and telling people about this in person. We were really impressed about how many people came, uh, how many people found out about it, and what it meant to people. You'll notice down at the bottom there are two pictures where there are only two people. Uh, one of them was the day that England made it to the semi-finals of the World Cup football. Not a popular day for being in a science museum. And the other day was the day after Pride. Um, also not a popular day, shockingly, <laughs> to go out and do things. So if you take nothing else from this talk but want to do LGBTQ history, make sure it doesn't coincide with major sporting events or the day after Pride, um, and you are in for a win. Um, but what was interesting to me was not just the process of developing this tour, but was also talking to the people who came on this tour afterwards. Um, so I'm hoping that you can read this, but just in case, um, the, tour, the pie chart on the left-hand side um, asked people when was the last time you came to the Science Museum. And um, what you'll notice is many people had not been to the Science Museum in an extremely long time. Um, there are scholars such as Folk who argue that one of the main reasons people turn up to, the, to museums in general is that their identity motivates them to go there. They find some part of them that they want to see represented or something that they want to see explored about themselves. And so what we can maybe infer from this diagram is that many people who came on these tours to learn about queer scientific heritage had not previously seen science, the Science Museum as a place where they would find knowledge about themselves or stories that they were interested in. Um, and even more importantly, among people who come regularly to the museum, we asked, like, would you have come this day? You know, maybe the whim had struck somebody to come, but we asked, would you come this day uh, if the tour hadn't been running? And um, because we had some people who worked at the Science Museum, we kind of unincluded them from this part of the survey, but nearly 60% of people who came specifically for the tour would not have come otherwise. So this tells us that we're bringing in visitors to the museum who otherwise wouldn't have been there to learn something that they were interested in, in learning themselves. Themselves. Um, but even more interestingly to me was that this wasn't people who kind of knew what was going to happen and then they came to hear stories they were already aware of. One of the most famous queer uh, people in British history is Alan Turing. Alan Turing is famous for um, 
cracking the cipher that the Nazis were using during the Second World War to be able to communicate in, in kind of like an encrypted way. Um, and he was persecuted by the British government. Um, ultimately, he was sterilized and committed suicide um, as a result. Um, but he is the kind of like famous LGBTQ history point for science and technology in the UK. And only kind of just over a third of people who responded to this survey said that they knew about Alan Turing, and a full third of them didn't know any of the stories, which means two thirds of people of the like one hour of content that we provided, of which there were eight stops, uh, most people had no idea what was going to be there. So they were learning entirely new knowledge about the history of science and technology in this museum through queer heritage, which is really exciting. They're finding out new things, new ways of seeing themselves, new ways of building their own identities in the present. Um, Draw on this really interesting book by Susan Ferentos on queer history in institutions. Um, but what Ferentos argues is that by doing this work, looking at LGBTQ history or queer perspectives, um, we're not simply looking at outsiders in society. We're not simply telling stories of those who've been marginalized. What we are also doing is telling, uh, um, as she says here, um, it gives us the potential to reveal a great deal about society as a whole we're able to learn a lot about the kind of norms and constructs that regulate the societies in which we live. Interesting to both those who are queer and want to learn about their own history as well as others. And so I think this is an, another way of thinking about doing these kind of interventions is that we're learning about the social constructs in which we all live by understanding the lives of those who fit maybe less well into the social norms that we construct for ourselves. Um, and this kind of focus both on LGBTQ history and queer theory really chimed uh, with people who came to the, to the tours. So just a couple of, um, I'm gonna just share with you a couple of quotes. Um, the first here, I like the fact that it wasn't just about queer scientists, although that was very interesting, but also flawed scientific studies and the lack of scientific studies on sex and gender issues. We talked a lot about the way like medical establishments and biological research um, are also shaping and shaped by the social perspectives and social contexts that the research is taking place in. And this certainly was eye-opening for many of the people on my tour um, who found that this was a way of really being critical about the type of information they were being told by their doctors in the news um, and by colleagues that they might have who were talking about this. The second quote here, I was expecting it just to focus on figures from the history of science who'd been overlooked or discriminated against, but like Alan Turing, not that focusing on those is a bad thing, um, but it went into much more detail than that. I think it's interesting, this quote I put in particularly, um, is interesting to me because the idea that coming on this tour would be learning about people who had been discriminated against as the default assumption tells us a lot about what we think about LGBTQ people um, and how we could move to position them as uh, independent and agential in their own rights rather than simply a group of people who've been discriminated against to change the perspectives um, of those coming on the tour. And I really think that's something that this person has taken away. Um, finally, um, I think this was really nicely touched on the introduction you gave me, uh, which was that when we go to science museums and when we think about science and technology in general, these are not the contexts that we think about restitution, that we think about feminism, that we think about queer theory, that we think about doing any of this anti-colonial work. This person says, it gave an alternative history in a space where the stories told about objects are often accepted without question. It really opened my eyes to the ways in which history is shaped by those who have the privilege to tell their stories from their perspectives. I thought it was incredibly important. I really think that this is something we should take away when we think about science in particular, because science has such an overarching like narrative of being true, objective, and without question in our society, and being able to show that not only in the present moment, but historically as well. Science has been a contentious issue, is extremely important to me, um, and I hope maybe to you after I've given this talk. Um, and finally, this uh, piece of feedback is the reason that I'm really interested in giving these talks and continuing to work on this, uh, which says, I just wish more science museums did this, which I think shows the way that um, science museums are being framed uh, as not being part of this discussion, as not being included in the larger anti-colonial work that is definitely really happening in museums in the UK, and I have no doubt, having listened to the talks today, that this is happening in the institutions here as well. 
Um, and so, uh, happily from that, like, I wish more science museums did this. The good news is I can tell you that they do, um, largely because people employed me to do them. <laughs> um, so uh, some of the data here is from the University of Cambridge Museums, who ran a project called Beyond the Binary. You can see some really exciting numbers here about the projects that they did, uh, most excitingly in this 58% uh, 53% up here in the cloud. I delivered the tours at the Polar Museum, which is this is for. This is 53% of the people who came on the tours had never been to the museum before. So this was bringing in new people, showing them narratives that they had not seen. We were written up in the Times of London, which is a national newspaper in the UK. Um, I also give tours at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is a museum of kind of social cultural heritage, or I said, should say give, gave. Uh, I no longer live in the UK. Um, but in these tours, I was particularly interested in highlighting the way that mechanical work and technology had facilitated the art and design in that museum um, and was able to kind of bring some of those stories about science and technology history into this socio-cultural space. Um, and finally, um, I did this, I wrote the tours at the Whipple Museum for the History of Science in the Sedgwick Earth Sciences Museum. Here is me with a dinosaur with the same color hair as me in the Dinosaur Museum. Uh, this dinosaur, definitely queer. Um, <laughs> Um, but if you'd like to know more about this, because obviously this was an extremely short talk and maybe listening to me talking in English is not the easiest thing, um, I wrote a piece that is publicly available for the British Society for the History of Science. This is online if you want to look it up. Um, and uh, who, the British Society for the History of Science kindly sponsored the tours initially. So we wrote about what we were doing in that, in that tour and a little reflection on it. I also have run a podcast series that tackles these kind of narratives in science museums across London. We looked at the Wellcome Museum, we looked at the Victoria and Albert Museum. There's a whole bunch of really cool people that I interview there to talk about kind of different types of uh, colonial structures in museums and how we could tackle them. Um, and if you're more academically inclined, um, I wrote a whole paper about these tours and the kinds of things um, that we found from them. It's open access on the Museum and Society Journal. Um, but if you're more interested in thinking about how to do this more generally or other approaches to uh, doing queer practice in science or technology spaces, I'm part of a recent collection called Queering, the Sci Queering Science Communication, uh, where I wrote about museums, but many other people wrote about other kinds of um, interpretive work that could be done in science spaces spaces to pluralize what's going on there. Um, so thank you so much for listening. I'll be around later if you don't want to ask your question out loud right now. Um, and also, you are more than welcome to find me on the internet and be in touch. So thank you so much.